Um, so I think each decade you seem to move on to a, a new challenge, and I think I have two left going by the decades. Um, but look, I'm delighted to be here, and, and really am um, excited to be in a role that we can help people, uh, good people, do good work. I just want to tell you a little bit about the charities regulation. We are uh, an independent statutory authority that must regulate, our mission is to regulate in the public interest and ensure charities comply with the law and then to support best practice in the governance, management and administration of charities. We have a very specific set of values including openness uh, and that's absolutely important. All the work we will do will be published um, as much as possible we will put on the web. Uh, we will let the public see what we're doing and what charities are doing. Um, our vision is a vibrant, trusted charity sector of value for the public benefit it provides. So our, uh, the authority and our board members believe that our vision is of one uh, with good people doing good work uh, out there in the charities around Ireland. Our main functions are to increase public trust and confidence in the management and administration of charities, to establish and maintain a register of charities which we're working actively on, and to promote compliance by trustees with their duties. And there are two very important aspects. We really want to get the public to understand that the people who are controlling the work and the mission of charities and the levers of charities are the trustees. And they need to ensure that the, the charity and the organization is working well. And then establishing the register of charities. Quite simply, that anyone can go in onto the register and look and see if the charity is compliant with the law, uh, see what the charity is doing, see its accounts, see how it pays money, see all this stuff, and then to decide, yeah, I like that, I'm going to support these people, I'm going to join this, um, or they may, which is happening already, when they look at our register and see an entity isn't registered and is looking for funding, they report them to us. And we've had that on a number of occasions. In fact, that's what's led to our first um, prosecutions. We want to ensure and monitor compliance with charities with the Act. This is really important. We are in the we're, we're developing a framework that's suitable for charities. I'm absolutely determined that we don't burden charities with unnecessary regulatory burden. I'm already aware that there's a commissioning burden in terms of people providing services, uh, and we don't want to add to that. I suppose to put it simply, we just simply think that. If people are competing with other not-for-profit organizations that aren't charities, it needs to be a fair playing pitch. Um, but that said, we want the public, when they see a registered Irish charity, that they can have confidence to give their time, or give their money, or give their goodwill, or, or support it. Um, and that it's not going to be pretty getting there, because you know when we do, we have a number of investigations on the go, and when we publish them, you will see a lot that's wrong with the charities. But in our monitoring approach, we also want to introduce monitoring visits where we can also publish uh, all the right things that are right about charities as well. So we just need to get there. Um, uh, well, I want to get there within the next four years. Um, so we will carry out investigations where considered necessary, and we're already doing that, unfortunately. Um, and we only go there where there's a burden of evidence for us, for us to go there. Um, and we will issue guidelines and codes of conduct for the benefits of charities. So we are going to be issuing our first guidelines, particularly this week, uh, in terms of internal financial controls for small to medium charities, and also guidelines for trustees of charities in terms of their obligations and duties. Then over the next while, we'll be introducing um, guidelines for charity trustees and conflicts of interest. We'll be introducing guidelines on how to wind up a charity, because this is an issue where people have done an amount of work have entered a gap, done an amount of work and realised, well actually, we don't need to be here anymore, this is now, this is a given, um, and so we need to, we would cease operating. Um, it's hard for people to do that. So a charity, so, you know, for me, I often think, you know, I'm a bit, I was a bit iffy about the word charity because it gives out certain connotations really, uh, but actually, I like the word now because I think it's very protective of good people doing good work. So. To be a registered charity, and we have registered about a thousand so far, prior to that everyone came across from revenue with a CHY number. To be a charity, to get registered by us, you must have a charitable purpose only. And they're the key purposes, they come from common law. And then any purpose that is of benefit to the community, this includes uh, relief of those in need by reasons of, of youth, age, ill health or disability. And the Act also allows for us to come up with new purposes that are benefit to the community. And this is important because Ireland doesn't stand still. Uh, what was needed 20 or 30 years ago in the gap 
um, may not be needed now, it may now be actually a state obligation. Uh, but all the time there's new obligations, uh, or there's new gaps that people will walk in and go, look, if the state isn't doing this, uh, there's no money in it for a private company, we're going to go in and do it. So we're all the time um, open to uh, what people might perceive to be a charitable purpose. It must provide a clear public benefit. So we're currently going through the register and there's a number of entities that have a charitable purpose, but there's no public benefit because they're not actually doing any work. You know, they've stopped uh, doing the particular work. So for us, a charity must have this and must have a clear public benefit. Not a benefit for one or two people. You know, when something happens, we have a great tradition in Ireland where if something happens to one of our friends or neighbours, we'd all get together, we'd go down the pub, have a night out, have a dance or something and raise a few bob. That's not a charity. Um, because there is no clear public benefit there. It's a benefit for an individual. And while worthy and absolutely a brilliant thing to do, it's not uh, a charity. One of the big things we're interested in is the income and property, aside from operation and maintenance, must be used to advance the charitable purpose. So we want to get people orientated around, this is the charitable purpose, these are the beneficiaries, that's where the money goes. That's how it works. And we need to be clear around that, and the trustees clear around that. Um, so all income and property, aside from the operation and maintenance, used to advance the charitable purpose. So there is a simple thing called the charity test. Uh, so if, if a body meets the charity test, if, it, if its purpose consists of only of one or more of the purposes, so it can only have a charitable purpose. You can't have a charitable purpose and another purpose, then you're not a charity. Um, and this is some of the things we, we can look closely at. And it provides also, um, or intends to provide public benefit in Ireland or elsewhere. So that's the charity test. When people make applications to us, apart from everything else, they're the two things that we're looking at. And even now, as we're getting applications for registration, we're finding personal interest, personal benefit uh, still comes out. Um, so, I mean, at least people think that we're in a, a new country where everyone is totally serving of, uh, you know, of people in need. Um, unfortunately, human beings aren't like that all the time. Um, so, the public benefit test, we have to apply it, and it is complex, because eventually it becomes subjective. You have an authority here, and we will form a view. We will then issue a yes or a no uh, when we're registering, and then that person can then appeal that to the charities tribunal. Uh, they will form a view. If we're not happy, we'll bring it to the courts. Uh, now, we don't want to be adversarial about it, but we do want to protect charitable purposes and, and what they're about. So it is a job of work. Very often people will complain, uh, and I, I like people complaining because it helps you to zone in on what you're supposed to be doing, about the length of time to be registered as a charity. Uh, and really, we want to get it down to Australia can do it quite quickly. Uh, but we want to, I don't want to register anyone unless I'm absolutely assured, absolutely the public benefit, uh, no private interest. So it takes a bit of time. Um, Okay, when private benefit does occur, you know, it can occur if it's reasonable in all circumstances and ancillary to furthering the public benefit. So like, obviously, if you, you know, if you're uh, providing a service, a physiotherapy service uh, as, as a charity, uh, you know, and a not-for-profit, you're going to have to, you're going to try and get the best physiotherapist who can travel around Ireland and do the work, and you're going to pay for that, you know? And so that's fair enough, that's ancillary because it's about you're actually chasing your charitable purpose and you know that there's a gap there, so you're going to do something about it. Um, so there are some things there that we have to watch out for. Um, there are limitations opposed on the class of persons who may benefit from the activities. Uh, if there are, we will consider that. So this idea of we're restricting it only to a certain amount of, of people, that may be needed in some cases. But in general, it's the idea of that a beneficiary can come along and seek the service. It's not restricted to a, a class of people. Um, and if it is that it's justifiable because those class of people won't get that help, they'll be left sitting unless there is a restricted charity helping them. So it just needs weighing up. Um, we also look at is there a charge payable for the service, so does it restrict people based on ability to pay rather than their needs? So we look at all those different things in the context of it. Um, to be honest with you, most people starting up charities now are starting from their heart, uh, that there is uh, an issue here that they've seen, that there's a gap. They've banged the door of the state down as much as they can. Um, the private sector has no interest in it. 
And so a group of people will come together and go, uh, we are going to enter this gap. And they're able to show the purpose, no private benefit, and get on with it. And this is something that we're very careful about. We don't want to regulate charities out of existence. We are an, ar an arm of the state to do a job. Charities aren't the state. And I know we hear a lot in the media about funding, etc., etc. We're very clear, charities are not the state. They're not private sector. There's this amount of people in the middle who are, who are required to have a charitable purpose only and a public benefit. So we're very, very mindful of that. Um, so we've been working really our first full year of operation this year. It's been in existence for a couple of years, but um, really this year was the first year we got our full powers under the Act and started getting the, the staff in to actually do the work. Um, it's going to take a few more years um, because I believe our work will be done when people aren't talking about the charities regulator, but rather they can get quick access to information to support um, registered Irish charities that they have confidence in. And I think that's when our work is done. And then we get smaller as the amount of uh, the charities and the services and everything get bigger. But we have been, the way we do it is, we must reach out to the public. The public are our eyes and ears. And when I say the public, people working in charities as well. Um, so the ordinary decent person who wants life to be good are our eyes and ears. And we have a, put in place a concerns line um, so that they can contact us both uh, by phone and by email. And we've received a number of concerns. And I, treat, I keep trying to emphasize this. A concern is a piece of information from a person where they believe there's a breach of the, the Charities Act. Um, we then take that information and we, we examine it and we verify it. And then we contact the charity, we seek assurances. Where we, don't, where we can't get the assurances, we meet the trustees. If we can't get the assurances there, it escalates up, right the way up into a potential investigation. Um, that's, that's how it will work. We're either assured or we're digging deeper. And that's just the, the way the regulation um, works. Um, so the main amount of concerns we're getting about is the legitimacy of the charity comes up as a major issue. So again, it's these people on the sidelines who aren't registered Irish charities who are setting themselves out. The bags that come to your door every day that are set up in a beautiful way so that it looks as though someone is going to be helped and actually it's some individual is making money for themselves. Um, the shop somewhere in a town, anywhere around Ireland, lots of them, uh, where it's set out that it's a charity shop. Now I'm fairly confident we've nailed that one even in the first year because we've prosecuted one lad already and if he even mentions the word charity again he'll be going to, I think it's Castle Regia. Um, so, and we've also got 11 other ones where they had the word charity and they weren't charities, but I know there's more around the country. And really that's important because as a source of funding for legitimate charities, the charity shop is a really good um, trading base for them. Um, so it was easy pickings, but it all came from the, the public. Uh, financial control and transparency is an issue that people will report in a lot, uh, as you can see it there. Um, political campaigning comes in. I just want to be clear about our position on political campaigning. We are not taking the position of the United Kingdom or the United States or some of the other common law countries. As far as we are concerned, so long as it's contingent and uh, associated with people's charitable purpose, they're absolutely entitled to get involved in uh, political dialogue and to agitate for, for change. Um, now that's very different too. You can't pick a party candidate, start spending the charity's money on them so that they get elected to the doll. Uh, that's not how it works. But we definitely want a small. We are. We will not be getting involved there unless it's it's a real real breach of the act uh, because it's important uh, that people are influence society. Um, so, and, and I mean, what we found with the political campaign was actually charities who had the same purpose were complaining about each other because they didn't agree with each other. And of course, in the society, the great thing is, is that uh, you don't have to agree with someone, but that doesn't mean it's illegal. Um, so we just, you know, we, we want people to come to us, uh, but we will we'll take a fair view. Uh, we won't undermine uh, a charity because we don't agree with their purpose or their approach. Uh, that's not our call. Um, so fundraising, we have a fundraising uh, panel in place and we're going to be issuing fundraising guidance from the public for charities in September. And again, they will be balanced and proportionate, taking into account that charities are, are uh, competing with other not-for-profits. Um, and then the private benefit comes up as well. The private benefit usually comes from within the charity. 
and then harm the beneficiaries. That comes up mainly around the animal um, charities, but people are worried that there's an animal charity there and it's not looking after the animals um, well. So a proportionate infrastructure. We need to put in place an infrastructure that allows, it's, the Act actually is clear for the better regulation of charities, but the Act is also clear the regulation and protection of charities. A lot of people don't get that. Uh, it's not a message that I think everyone hears. They hear regulation, um, they don't hear the protection. But we put in a lot of services to protect charities. Um, so for example, their assets, uh, if, they're, if they need to sell assets, uh, if they're not sure about things, trustees, they can come to us and we can revise them vis-a-vis -vis our charitable services committee. Um, that said also, if we feel that a charity is not being well run, and we feel that the purpose, and we have the evidence that the purpose uh, is in jeopardy, we can also step in to protect the charity and the charitable purpose. Um, so what we're trying to do is make sure that we're fair and strong in our regulation. My board members have significant experience in charities and in the not-for-profit, and, and they're, they're fairly, they are absolutely unified in, in getting this um, right. I suppose any person can see, any reasonable person looking at the amount of good going on in registered Irish charities uh, would have to say that that good needs to be protected. But with any sector that's newly regulated, you have to give them a chance to come into compliance. So for example, in 2015, only over 800 charities were in compliance with the law at the end of 2015. 2016, we started doing our work and assisting them. Over, it's gone up to four and a half thousand. So if you give people the framework, they will come into compliance. But we have to be mindful of this wasn't there before. The first thing you say to someone, the regulator and governance, you mentioned those two words, I think people get worried and they may close down around it, you know? Um, so we are mindful of that, that we get our message across. Um, we're going to be introducing accounting and reporting regulations for registered Irish charities. We've already agreed with the Minister that there be amendments to the Act to include, that all charities will be included, including companies, because 80% of charities are companies. And basically how that will work in a nutshell is, Smaller charities, 40 grand or less, let's say 40 or 50 grand or less, we need to know you exist, we need assurance from you you're keeping proper books of account, and we need you to report and keep your basic data up to date. 50 to 250, uh, there's an incremental higher level of information we need, but it's still basic accounting, uh, it, just your, your profit and loss and your balance sheet. And then we were introducing a thing called an independent examiner so that you're not paying for a full audit. Uh, so it's a different way of assuring us that your accounts are intact. Over 250, we're going into a thing called charity SORP, which is a very, very transparent way of showing your accounts, including how much you pay people, uh, and all the things that the public are interested in, and we're all interested in. And again, that needs to be audited. We've gone out to consultation on that. That's a big project next year. Uh, that we'll be going out developing our guidance and educating the sector for a year before it comes in the year after because you can't just go from one set of accounts to the other. Uh, it needs to happen in time. That is, that is the biggest change, will be the biggest change, I think, in charity law in the history of the state because it will then mean that all the information will be out there and people will be able to analyse it and tell how much money is coming in even to all the charities and where it's being spent, what's being spent on. Uh, it's been spent on solicitors, accountants, beneficiaries, staff, you know? So, and, and I think that's the transparency we want because I think good charities doing good work have absolutely nothing to fear from this because as we all know, well, I know when I worked in, in uh, I spent most of my time trying to gather the money uh, to provide the services. Uh, I mean, you could pretty much stand over it. Um, so it's, it's good from that perspective. We're going to be introducing a digital platform so a lot can be done online because we, we, we're very conscious of this burden. Um, the consultative panel on fundraising, I spoke about the report is due. We've introduced the consultative panel on governance and I've asked uh, that panel to tell me what we need to do to improve the governance. Specifically, how can we support trustees and help trustees get more of them in, support and help them. Then, do we introduce regulations or do we go for some sort of a code or guidelines uh, and really for me the only thing is I know there's a number of codes out there I, I was just speaking about uh, Picasso out in the hall 
For me, the main thing is, if we're going to go with guidelines or codes, there has to be some validation of them. And I don't mind if that's peer validation, so long as it's independent. And there has to be some form of site visit. Now, so they're the things in my head I'm interested in, rather than regulations. Because uh, I, you know, I just think we have to be proportionate. We're going to publish the guidance. That's all starting now. And again, we've looked at other jurisdictions, and we've talked to charities and representatives there. And too much guidance creates a burden because when the regulator issues guidance, everyone sometimes people can leave the day job and concentrate on doing what the regulator wants. So we just want the guidance to be just enough uh, to keep charities uh, um, good, you know, and on the ball. Um, and then we're going for the amendments to the Charities Act. We've had a lot of support from uh, pretty much everyone across uh, the Oireachtas, uh, old houses. I think, I think it's something that brings all politicians of all shades together that they want the charity sector to be a vibrant, supported uh, sector. Um, so we've had a lot of support there. Um, so I just want to go back to the one thing, because I'm not sure if anyone here is a trustee. But if you're not, I would urge you to become a trustee of a charity. Because if you're motivated enough to be here today uh, to be involved, the trustees are the key people. Um, so my granny used to talk about this thing of the baking of the cake. We'd all arrive to our house and all the ingredients would be there. And we'd all try and bake a cake each and they'd all be horrible. Uh, but her one was always perfect, even though we were using the same ingredients. So the trustees are the people who take the ingredients and make sure that it comes out well. Um, they're responsible for all aspects of the governance and management of the charity. They may delegate down to management, but they're accountable in law. And they are the bakers, and they're accountable to us, the regulator, its donors, its beneficiaries, and the public. That's what the law says now. There's no private here, backroom stuff, you know, uh, going on where we're running something for ourselves. It's all out there in the public and the public interest. And that's the way it should be, because if you think of the sector, I mean, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, there's, there's people working now on things when I was growing up didn't exist. I mean, when I was in uh, Schizophrenia Ireland, it's now Shine and Nine, we were advocating for counselling services, advocacy, peer advocacy, and people were looking at us as though we had 10 heads, and that was 20 years ago. You know, so there's always this idea of how do we move on and how do we make sure that we're a public, um, public benefit. So just to finalise, the board of the authority have set out a strategy. Um, my staff and I will implement it. We will support trustees, absolutely, if people come to us. Uh, if they don't come to us, uh, and if we find evidence, uh, we will push on with our duties as well. Everything will be transparent, everything will be published. Um, we would support the trustees, but we need the input of all stakeholders um, to achieve our vision. And I believe it should be a shared vision, um, which is a vibrant, trusted charity sector uh, valued for the benefit it provides. So look, thank you, and uh, I hope it was interesting.